Let's get our Bibles open to um, Galatians chapter 2. Wonderful to see you. If you're visiting with us, we, we began a new series in Galatians. You're, you're towards the beginning of it. Um, last week, can I very quickly kind of remind us. Um, so Paul, he's writing to these churches of Galatia. And I told you that my, my opinion is, is he probably has in mind southern Galatia where we know he's visited uh, Lystra, Iconium, uh, Derby. You got Antioch of Pisidia. By the way, and typically, just as a side note, you got those two Antiochs, Antioch of Pisidia, and then you have Antioch of Syria. Most of our study is dealing with the Antioch of, of Syria. But um, he, he's, he's really disappointed. He's, he's astonished because he's allowing Jewish Christians to f- pull them back to demands of the old law, in particular circumcision. We're going to read about that. But it really, that, that's, that's a representation of just several aspects of the law, but specifically circumcision, which was this, this covenant that God had with Israel in the past and was obviously very uh, meaningful to them. He's upset about this, and he feels that he needs to defend his apostleship and his message. And by the way, get, so hello, good morning. I'm jumping into this. You know, these, these two first lessons are going to feel a little bit more technical in nature. You know, whenever the churches received this, it probably only took them about 25 minutes to re- have it read out loud to them. So the nature of this, it makes it feel a little slower. I'm going to do my best to bring some life to the technical side, but we are going to hit it. Um, last week, his point was, is that, listen, I was traveling to Damascus. That's whenever the Lord appeared to me. I didn't receive my message from anyone. And in fact, I left Damascus, went to Arabia, came back to Damascus, okay, after about three years of that conversion. Then I went to Jerusalem. But when I was in Jerusalem, I was only there for a short amount of time. Paul was only there for about 15 days. We can read about this in Acts chapter 9. And he says, and then I went back, you can see at the end of chapter 1, then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. And so his point is, and excuse me talking so fast, but we got to move this morning. His point is, is that I didn't receive this message from man, I received it from God. Well, he's not done. And he's going to talk about something else that happened, as as you'll see in verse 1 of chapter 2. Then 14 years I went up to Jerusalem, again with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. When we read through these passages, there's been, for the longest time, discussion, what event is he talking about? When did this take place? Acts, I love it, but it can also be so frustrating because there is so much that is left out in Acts. Be really careful whenever you're reading passages in Acts that you think you have all the information about a certain account. Many times later on, you'll find out that more information is given. Okay, so so we're wondering like, hey, when did this occur? Um, I let, here's what I'm offering. First of all, in the book of Acts, there's at least five recorded times where Paul travels to Jerusalem. So Acts 9:26 is after he's converted, and then Acts chapter 11 is whenever he's uh, with some brethren goes to send some relief for the brethren in Jerusalem. That's the second one. The third one is Acts 15. And that's what's typically known as the Jerusalem Council. Many people think that Acts 15 is the background to Galatians chapter 1 and following. And that may be right on. Then you got another group of people that think that it's actually Acts chapter 11. That's the background to it. And then you got a small... Uh, uh, some people go, maybe it's neither of them. It's, it's probably one or the other. And I, as I was trying to figure out what's the best way to approach this, I hate to do this, but I've got to do it this way, I think. I'm going to read you Acts 11, give you the details. I'm going to read you parts of Acts 15, give you the details so you know what the background is. And then I'm just going to read the text and leave it to you. Is that fair enough? So let's go back to Acts chapter 11. So again, in Acts chapter 9... He's converted, he goes to Damascus, and then our attention is back on Peter. It's back on Peter in chapter 10, it's back on um, Peter in chapter 11. But then we've got got this pause in the narrative. And we find out that after the stoning of Stephen, 
the, these Christians are scattered and they're preaching the gospel message. And it comes to Antioch. I'm, I'm going very quickly here. The church in Jerusalem hears about this. And they say, you know what? Let's send Barnabas to go help support those new Christians in Antioch. Of course, Barnabas gets there and he's just thrilled. And he says, I got to get Paul involved. So then he goes to Tarsus and he gets Paul and he brings him back to Antioch of Syria. That's about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And he, and he brings him to Antioch. And they're with the church there for like a year. And this really ends up being a, a really important group for Barnabas and Saul. <laughs> It is in that context now, in chapter 11, verse 27, Now in the days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders, by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Pretty straightforward, right? Then the narrative gets back to Peter. And can I point out, then at the end of chapter 12, it goes back to Paul and Barnabas. And in verse 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. There are other times whenever Paul is going to, to help with the relief of saints in Jerusalem, but that's later on. This is the first one, a separate account. So here's what, what I'm seeing in this passage. Agabus shared a revelation, right, concerning a coming famine. Fair? Okay. He comes from Jerusalem to Antioch. The disciples in Antioch, this, this newly found local fellowship, decide to send relief to the brethren in Judea by the hand of Paul and Barnabas. And then we can see at the end of Acts chapter 12, they make it there, they, they give the, these funds, and they return back to Antioch from Jerusalem. That's all we got, okay? Acts 15, let's skip forward. Acts 15. So this is sometime later now. Acts 15. <coughs> I'm not going to read every passage just for, for the, because of the, the time that we have. Okay, Paul and Barnabas are, are in Antioch. Again, are in Antioch of Syria. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circum, uncircumcised, sorry, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension in debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria. You've got to remember, again, it's 300 miles north, so it's, they're not getting there in a couple of days. And they've got to make this big, long trip back to Jerusalem. And so as they're going, they're, they're sharing the, 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 the good news with everybody. Okay, uh, both Phoenicia and Samaria describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, so again, just to be clear, they're, so that's their background, but they're, they're Jewish Christians. They're Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And so whenever they come and they hear this, they go, well, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Uh, yeah, that's true. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, and then Peter begins to give his defense. You're going to see in verse 12, and all the assembly fell silent and then they listened to Barnabas and Paul, and they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. And then James gives his defense on why Gentiles could be, should be added in. And then in verse 19, therefore, this is James still speaking to the assembly. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. 
For from ancient generations, Moses had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. If I may say so, he's got a combination of things that they had to keep and then things for conscience sake. He's got a mix of items. He's like, because the deal is that Moses is being written, no matter where you go, this is going to be some issues. And so we're encouraging them to keep to these things. Verse 22, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders and the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So in other words, back from where they, they came, Paul, that is Paul and Barnabas, right? They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. I'm going to stop right there. So they give them the, the so what of what happened. Here's what I see happens from this account. Men from Jerusalem traveled to Antioch. They were demanding circumcision to be saved. Now, that, did not, that was not with the blessing of the, of, the, of the leadership there. Matter of fact, they said they, they went out from among us, and we didn't say these things. We, did, we didn't send them, okay? But that's what happened. They came from Jerusalem church, went to Antioch, says you got to be circumcised. Paul and Barnabas debate them. Then... They traveled with uh, others from Antioch to discuss this with the elders and apostles in Jerusalem, right? They shared the good news of Gentile converts to brethren in Phoenicia and Samaria as they traveled. They're welcomed by the church in Jerusalem, and they share the good news with them. Then some of these Jewish believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees are saying, no, they got to be circumcised. We do need to force the law of Moses on them. And so then the elders and the apostles... Uh, uh, gather together to discuss this issue at hand. Now, I, will, I put in here, is this just the elders and the apostles? Some think it is, but some think it just says that because it's a representation of the group. Because in verse 12 it says, and all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas. So in other words, like it does, all the assembly seems to carry that idea of like not just the apostles and elders, but everyone, though that can't be proven. But then you notice, too, that whenever they send the letter in verse 22, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send this letter. And so they think, like, well, wouldn't it be likely that the church is agreeing to something that they've actually been able to hear the argumentation? And so the reason why this comes into play, because is this a private setting or is this a public setting? And a lot of people say, well, it seems like it's more of a public setting. Okay, I'm just offering thoughts and information. What you have here is Peter, Barnabas, Paul, and James address the assembly. Judgment is made by all the people to send a letter to the Gentiles in Antioch, where they come from. Instruction is to abstain from idols, sexual morality, and what has been strangled and from blood. That's the message. That's Acts 11. I'm sorry, but I'm trying to help you when you get to Galatians 2 to form your own thoughts about what's going on here. That's the passage. Now let's read our text this morning. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. So I'm going to pause now. Now that I've done that, I can start interjecting. Well, then after 14 years, I went up again. Some think, well, that sounds like he's doing it in sequential order. And if that's the case, then we're going back to Acts 11, not Acts 15. But some go, eh, you could be making too much out of that, okay? I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. Titus isn't mentioned in Acts 11 or Acts 15. Barnabas is mentioned in both. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, although privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. Okay, well, he goes up by revelation. Well, Acts chapter 11, he goes to Antioch because of a revelation of a famine. Acts 15 speaks of no revelation. However, <laughs> whenever Paul in, in, Rome, in Acts 9, whenever he first travels to Jerusalem and they were wanting to kill him and the brothers find out, they send him away, right? And that's all it says. But you find out later on in Acts 22 that Jesus also came to him and told him to get out of town. What's my point? Those that think that it's Acts 15 say, well, there could have been a revelation from, from the Lord. It's just not recorded. I'm just, what my job this morning is to offer information. That's what I'm going to do, okay? I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. 
Uh, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was Greek. Again, Titus isn't mentioned in any of them. Paul had Timothy circumcised because his mother was Jewish and his father was Greek. And because the work that he was going to be doing, it was going to be more helpful to go ahead and circumcise him so that it wouldn't be a stumbling block to preach the gospel. But in this scenario, Titus is being, he's being pressured to be circumcised and what's implied in the context is because he has to be. And Paul said, nope, not going to do it. Okay? Verse 4, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so they might bring us into slavery, translation, trying to pull us back to the old law, which is going to make us slaves of sin again. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And those from who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, that just means that Peter's main focus was with the Jewish people, and Paul's main focus was with the Gentile people, okay? For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through, uh, through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was e eager to do. So you can imagine, you're reading this, and you're like, this is Acts 15. <laughs> you got an issue with circumcision, you got Paul, you got Barnabas, you got Cephas, and you got these guys mentioned, oh, and James, and you got them mentioned in Acts 15. John's mentioned here, but that doesn't mean that John wasn't there in Acts 15. Okay? On the flip side, the other people will say, why didn't he just tell them, hey, you remember the whole big council we had? Why are you acting as if that didn't happen? You already know that we met about this issue, and we sent a letter, literally, you're the first congregation I came back to, and I, I hand-delivered this. On top of that, he says that they only asked us to remember the poor. Well, in Acts 15, that's, their mission is to go back and, and to share what the Gentiles needed to be doing, they didn't say anything about the poor. People are like, in Acts 11, though, his point of going there was for the poor, and it would make sense that what happens is he goes to Antioch, and they deliver this, and there's a private meeting that happens that Luke just doesn't get into because this kind of stuff could happen. But the point is he went there, he had this dispute, but they received the alms, and they said, hey, continue to remember the poor. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm offering both sides. But when Cephas came to Antioch, so now we're skipping forward. If, if you take the position that this is Acts 15, they could say this is like years later. Um, but those that think it's Acts 11, it could have happened very shortly after. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Let me tell you what happened. So, Peter ends up coming to Antioch, and he, he's fine with the Gentiles, and he's eating with them. But then certain men from James, and I don't know if James sent them, and then they went too far, or if James was still struggling with what was going on, but the bottom line is, they're not going to eat with the Gentiles, and Peter gets caught up in this, and refrained from eating with the Gentiles now and will only eat with Jewish Christians. Verse 13, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with them. So now, the other Jewish Christians at that local fellowship start doing the same thing. So that even Barnabas, and you read that and you're like, no, not Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Yeah, even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, let me first of all just say what he was saying. 
you're a Jew, but when you get here, you're not acting Jewish. You're eating with them. But then the Jews come around, and you start acting like a Jew. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You start acting like you've got to do this thing, which implies then that you're forcing them to live like you, a Jew. And this is totally out of line. One last comment about the Acts 11 or Acts 15. And I, and I will say, this, this, I do, this is a good thought. It's, it doesn't prove anything, but it's easier to picture Peter still getting used to this after Acts chapter 10. You know what I mean? And yes, Cornelius, and they're added in, and I've, I've eaten, I've been with him. Um, he's already been criticized, by the way, in Acts chapter 11 for, for, for eating with Gentiles. I, it's easier to fathom him still trying to get used to this versus this happening after the Jerusalem council where all the apostles and the elders are together and they send letters out. And then after that big hoorah, he goes back to Antioch and does it again. It doesn't prove it. It's just that, man, that's like, that's, that's a bigger pill to swallow. But guys, it doesn't matter. Here's the bottom line. Paul is saying this. I don't rely on these guys. And, and, and who they are really doesn't matter to me because God is not a respecter of persons. But, but, but if we're going to go there, I will point out, they weren't, in, they weren't against what I was teaching. They offered their right hand of fellowship. And let me also say something, that I didn't have a problem rebuking Peter by doing what he did that was wrong, and I don't have a problem rebuking you over this. So what he's doing is he's bolstering his position as an apostle of Jesus Christ in the message. Now, verse 15 through 19. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And it's like, oh, because see, and I think he does this on purpose because a Jew, when speaking of the Gentile world, that's how you viewed them. And generally speaking, they actually weren't wrong, but they're the Gentile sinners. But watch what he does here. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Well, certainly not. What if I rebuild what I tore down? Uh, sorry, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Here's what he's saying. First of all, guys, Christ led us to faith, not works in the law, number one. That is our fundamental message, and especially us Jewish Christians need to hear this. Number two, Christ's servants may sin, but that does not make him a servant of sin. And I think what Paul may be doing here is being polite now to Peter. Look with me in verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Listen, Peter was trying to be justified in Christ. But even Peter got caught up, and he ended up doing something wrong. Does that make Jesus Christ a servant of sinners? No. Listen, if Paul or Peter is trying to build up what he had already torn down, that's Peter's problem. That's not Jesus' problem. But of course, what's implied in all of that, but if what I'm saying is that if that is wrong, and Christ is not a servant of sin, then what I'm saying is that the message that I'm preaching is correct and what Peter was doing was wrong and is not backed by Jesus. What does the law teach? He says that the law has proven to us that if you want to be righteous, then keep the law. But the problem is none of us have kept the law perfectly. So the thing is, is that the law is not bad. He's saying, pay attention to the law. The law is actually pushing us to Jesus. It's pushing us to put faith in God because we cannot save ourselves. Do you see that? And then finally, verses 20 and 21. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Brethren, it reminded me, what happened in baptism? We were forgiven of our sins, and amen, that's right. We were justified by God. But Romans chapter 6, 1 and following are teaching us that it was at that point that we were crucified with Christ. We died with Christ. We were buried. We put, took the old man and we buried him in a watery grave. His heart's not beating anymore. He died. And what was raised up to walk in a newness of life was done so by the power and the love and the grace of God our Savior. That's what his motivator was. He says, I am his and I am completely his. The life that I now live is a Messiah life. That's me in a nutshell. So who's leading your life? You or Jesus? Well, what do you mean by me? He's like, well, you are. Right now, that's my fear because you're more intimidated by these Judaizers and what they think about you and their judgment and their threats. You're more concerned about them than you are being accepted and liberated by Christ. These guys will pull you back down and make you a slave. Jesus Christ, by the way, will liberate you. Now see, I'm going to have to be careful because now in chapter 3 and 4, we're going to get into all of this. And I don't, want to, I, I, don't, I don't want to be too repetitive. What were these false brothers doing with the grace of God? He says, I'm telling you that if you approach God this way, you are nullifying the grace of God. You are making void the grace of God. What you are saying is that Jesus Christ died for what? For what then? Because if you think you're that good based on your works of the law, then you didn't need Jesus. Oh, and Jesus, you died for, for nothing. Now see, and, I, and I'm done for this morning. But see, this, this, Roman, uh, this letter is weird because we don't have this issue here. <laughs> now, by the way, this issue still actually is occurring. It's just not as prevalent here in the U.S. But in certain neighborhoods in the U.S., when you got Jewish friends and you're talking to them, this becomes relevant again. In the East, this is relevant. So it's still alive and well today. But brethren, I'll tell you, we need to hear this in the body. Because in times past, because the grace of God, the t- that, and what I mean by that, the teaching on the grace of God, because it has been used and abused, we've come in to stress obedience. Let me tell you something. Obedience. If you love Jesus, you will obey him. Paul, who wrote the saints in Rome, who addresses the same issue, starts and ends his letter with bringing about the obedience of the faith. But let me tell you where I have, can go wrong and where you can go wrong. You can stress obedience so much, time and time again and again, that it begins to shift from obedience without motive to works of the law so that you may be saved. Let me say that again. It can shift from obedience driven by love to obedience without love, which becomes works of the law, so that you may be saved. And I'll tell you what, if you get caught in that current, that wave that hits you, That undertow, it is very difficult to get out of. And that we struggle with. But I'll end it with this. Having said that, while that is a general observation, we still do have people that within the body that also need to be reminded of this. 
Jesus Christ, your Savior, Savior, the Prince of Peace, is Lord of Lord, Kings of Kings, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. He is your, your, your friend, but he is also your master. He is not common, and he deserves our obedience. And whenever times get rough, sometimes you do need to be reminded, it's not what the flesh wants, but he purchased you. So obey him and trust in him because it is for your good. If you say you love him, if you're going to call him Lord, then do what he's telling you to do. Do not treat him as common. Amen? And I think we need to hear that as well. So I, 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 I pray this has blessed you. Chapter 3 and 4, we're going to get into some into the workings, and it's really powerful. Um, please, if you have the ability, read ahead. And uh, during the week, if you've got any thoughts or questions, um, send me a message or give me a call. I love talking to you, and we can chew on this some more together. God bless you. Let's uh, stand and, and sing praises to God together.